Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alex Gibney. You've just heard a very powerful appeal by Lena Alhaflul on behalf of her sister, Lou Jane. I'm joined now by two Saudi women who are here to help shed light on the regime that imprisoned and tortured Lou Jane. Safa al Hamad and Manal al Sharif, thank you for being here. We're going to have a conversation, free flowing. Um, Manal, I'll start with you. Uh, you, like Lou Jane, you know, had fought. Um, to get women the right to drive and also to call for an end to some of the guardianship laws in Saudi Arabia. Could you give us a sense, give the audience a sense of what day-to-day -day life is like for Saudi women? It depends on what year. In 2002, when I left my family and found my job, I wasn't able to rent a house or a, or a hotel room. I wasn't able even to get my, uh, my identification papers without my father permission. And still, I'm turning 40 this year, and I'm still a minor. By law, I'm a minor. My son, my own son, when he turns 18, he will become my legal guardian. And that's the, I'm not kidding you, I'll kick his butt if he becomes my guardian. <laughs> <laughs> so it's five years for me to fight for the guardianship to, to end before uh, my son becomes my own guardian. He's watching this, by the way. I love you, Abudi. And, uh, so yes, women in my country living under uh, male guardianship, and that means a man, from the time she's born to the time she dies, she needs a permission from a, a, from a man. And it's usually one man assigned to her as a guardian. She can't even leave her country. My father, until this day, have to give me a permission when I want to leave the country. I'm just imagining if this guardianship falls, how many women will lift in Saudi Arabia? We joke, we call it kingdom of men. And it will literally become kingdom of men when they lift the guardianship system and women can flee or leave freely Saudi Arabia. Safa, you've made um, many important films both on Saudi Arabia and also about what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen. But give a sense of context to what Manal was just saying. I, I mean, conditions are, are rough for women, but set, the, set that in a broader context, both in terms of men and also in, in terms of the whole sort of government system. Right. So, uh, in my opinion, Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship. It's a theocracy. And uh, what's happening to women is also happening to men in the context of there are no rights for anyone. They do not believe in the rights of their citizens. And so part of the thing, the, the film that I did do on Saudi Arabia was about the uprising that started in 2011 that what came along with all the other uprisings that were happening in the region. And part of the problem, and I think of not understanding Saudi Arabia, and uh, as part of the media will take responsibility in that, the media has been quite specific about what they're interested in and what context they want to see Saudi Arabia in. They want to see Saudi Arabia in the context of royalty. We only talk about the royal family. We talk about the kings and the princes and what they do and what they don't do. We rarely talk about Saudi Arabia as its people. And so it, when the, the protests started, one of the biggest challenges was to talk about the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia and not talk about it as in what the king is doing to other countries or not talk about it as in Saudi Arabia still had a ban on women driving. And everybody was interested in, oh, let's do a film about the ban on uh, women driving. To me, that was a problem, not just for understanding Saudi Arabia, but for people from outside to actually understand Saudi Arabia as well. We have to push for more complex understanding of the endemic suffering of the people themselves at structurally. The structure of Saudi Arabia as it is right now is oppressing everyone, top to bottom. The royal family to the people below them, to the people below them, women to their drivers, to their maids. And so we're all made to oppress anybody who's lesser than us. And if we don't understand it, not just in the context of gender, but also of class, because very rarely do people talk about Saudi Arabia in the concept of class. So when you're talking about even renting a house or getting a driver, who can aff afford a driver? Who can bring them in? Who can afford a maid? All of these things are not spoken about because there are so many stereotypes about how people from outside want to understand what's going on in Saudi Arabia. We're just having this talk uh, in the backstage about MBS, right? right? Mohammed bin Salman. I mean, he's become the person to talk about when you talk about Saudi Arabia. To me, that is a problem because we need to talk about Saudi Arabia as a country, as a government that has institutions and we need to challenge and and face the institutional issues. We're talking about the, uh, the court cases. I mean, 
it's a joke to talk about the Ministry uh, uh, of Justice. It's a joke to talk about the women and the men who are being taken to court now and call it justice. And we have to question these things. So forgive me for since you advised <laughs> us all not to talk about MBS or. I'm not saying not talk about it. No, no. I'm saying talk no, no, about no, no, it no. within uh, the context. No, no, I understand. State, right? I, I'm just saying I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot to that for a mm. second with Manal. Um, give us a sense. I mean, when MBS first appears on everyone's radar, he's the great reformer. Uh, <laughs> that seemed to have disappeared rather rather quickly in. Um, uh, in the Saudi embassy in, uh, in Istanbul. He actually claimed that I never called myself a reformer. Yeah. He said the media called me a reformer. So he's not even self-proclaimed. How did he reformer. get away with that? that was we let him get away with that. In the yes, yeah. we, 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 we the media. Yeah. Yes. To go back to Safa, I wanted to stay away from politics. And um, every time someone asks me about the politics, I'm like, it's so dangerous. I could lose my life because I go back and I have a family there. But unfortunately, after all these years of fighting, I knew it was all about changing the political system in Saudi Arabia. And because I'm living in a self-imposed exile today in Australia, uh, I can't speak up more than the times I was allowed to go back to my country. I'm in a self-imposed exile because all my friends who fought with me are in jail today. And that made me realize it is the political system that's corrupt are those people on top of the power are the people who need to be changed. We, need an we live in one of the last existing absolute monarchies in the world where people don't have a say. And as you said, it's a hierarchy of oppression. So the royal family oppress the, 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 the men and the men are giving the women uh, to oppress because they, ha they don't even own their own life, the men. And now they're giving something to put to, I'd say, vent that need for control or at least to be hurt. But can I also add, they frightened the men to such an extent that they don't even know. The red lines right now in Saudi Arabia are not clear anymore. Yes. There used to be red lines. Yes. Like when Lujain first drove uh, 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 across the border, it was there were clear lines of what will and will not happen. Now, not only do they imprison you, they can disappear your family. They can put them uh, under arrest, as in banned from traveling. So everybody, even those who are released, are not allowed to travel for years afterwards. Oh, there's, there are. I've been hacked. All my accounts have been hacked. Yeah. Whoever on Twitter, that's not me. And that's uh, what's happening. They are hiring X intelligence from the US. And there was a New York Times piece about it. I work in information security. Surprise, I have a career. And information security, I knew that the activists, I would teach the activists how to stay, mm -hmm. how to stay safe online and when they tweet and how to, uh, I'd say, uh, not hide their tracks, like take care of themselves when they are uh, online. Now they're ready to pay up to a million dollars to hack one activist phone. So now they went to that extent. A lot of Twitter accounts the, are ghost towns now. We're doing, they're anonymous Twitter account. The people who were tweeting who were a critique of the government, they disappeared. Uh, it was forced disappearance. I'm on top of a case of Abdurrahman al-Sadhan. His sisters came out. I'm gonna meet her in San Francisco. Her brother was dis disappeared in March 2018. No one ever heard of him. So not only they, they, they do this to your family, if you're living inside Saudi Arabia, but they hunt you down, even when you're living That's outside. I just wanted yes. to get at, yes. In, in terms of the, what, what happens to you if you're, a, if you're a Saudi citizen and you're a critic of the Saudi regime when you're outside. This, this is what I want to, why don't you expand on that? Because can, we, can we just stay for a second on the people who are still inside? Yeah. Yes. The, the, the facts of not only that they are disappeared, their families are even afraid to say yes. that they've been arrested yes. because everybody hopes, and this is what they do when they arrest you, it's like, oh, we're just going to have a conversation with you and we'll let you go in a few yes. days. Yes. So your family is constantly in the hope if they stay silent uh, as with the Hedlul family for a, a quite a while, everybody is, uh, is hoping if they don't say anything, if they don't criticize, yes. if they don't tell human rights activists that the, the, uh, my, uh, my family member has been arrested, uh, and this is why a lot of the women, when, uh, when the arrest started happening, they didn't actually know who the other women were in, in, uh, in a lot of the activist circles. And so they, they, they tell me, it was like, we don't know how many have been disappeared. We don't know the number because the families will not tell us and hope that they will be released. And obviously, That's so happened. true. So a lot of women, uh, their names are not out, out there. And I knew just by coincidence, yeah. because the girls in jail, they saw them there and the families are quiet. 
And my family, when I was in jail, they were being told to stay quiet and that's for the best interest of your daughter. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, the world didn't stay quiet when I was there. There's a lot of uh, reports of torture trickling out of the country. Is this, is, is there an intentionality to that? Is, is torture they tor Torture them accidentally, you mean? No, no, I mean, <laughs> is it letting the news out, you know, instead of keeping it secret, letting the news out as if to dissuade other people. Is it a, a device to, 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 to really try to stifle the... For the record, Mohammed bin Salman is not the one who started doing a torture in prisons. That, that, I mean, if you look at any human rights uh, report on Saudi Arabia going back decades, they have done, done this. The, 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 the scary thing is the magnitude of it and also the scale of how many women have been put in prison is unprecedented as well. I think torture and prison and letting people know that they're doing that, just like the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, is a message. So even if people are thinking about participating, even if they want to say something for their family members, you all in the back of your mind is like, how much am I willing to pay for saying this? And I, I, I think this is quite a detrimental uh, thing for most people inside Saudi Arabia. I know so many of my friends are now people who have managed to find some space in Saudi Arabia and they're like, no, no, we will stay, we will do something, are now leaving the country. Right, because it, the, the level of violence and repression has dramatically increased, would you say? And also, I mean, in the past few days, m more than 13 people ha have been disappeared, arrested. I say disappeared because they don't tell the families. So, sometimes they just yeah. get taken and nobody knows about them and everybody's like, uh, is his cell phone uh, working? Did he, did he get the WhatsApp messages? So we're all trying to figure out who, uh, who just decided, you know, to detox digitally and, and <laughs> shut off his phone, or that they, they, they've been taken. The, un the unofficial number now is 15,000 yeah. prisoners of conscience in one year. Mm. And worldwide, around 1,000 people like last year applied for asylum. And um, I didn't apply for asylum and a self-imposed exile. So there are a lot of Saudis choose not to go back. Uh, my mother is Libyan, and I grew up hearing the stories of my cousins who disappeared or my cousins who left the country and never went back. I never, I never believed like those stories. It looked like surreal to me that a country exists with such brutal leadership. Mom passed away. Now I'm living that exact thing that mom, growing up, mom was telling us. We're witnessing another Qaddafi. We're witnessing other half of Assad, where he's forcing his people either into disappearance or leaving the country. And that really scares me because he's young. I was so happy. It's the same reason it made me happy. He was young. And it's the same reason makes me concerned. He's young. And they live really long, up to 80 years. <laughs> and that scares me. So we could witness a country until the oil loses its strategic importance. We are witnessing a country that the biggest two exports of that country are oil and terrorists. Men leave my country to join SS. Men leave my country to die, women leave my country to live. That tells you a lot about my country. We talked about, Safa, we talked about the, the false image of Mohammed bin Salman as a reformer. To what extent was the United States enormously complicit in pushing that image? Hmm. Well, uh, for, for one, I was not optimistic. Now I want to give two my flip my bear, the, the bear, <laughs> two times. <laughs> you may censor that, I'm sorry, it's live, I know. <laughs> I think the American-Saudi relation uh, transcends both these men. Um, I think uh, the Americans have been complicit in, in many atrocities in the region and not just in Saudi Arabia. What is happening in Yemen is quite frightening. And so you, you mentioned Assad. I think Bashar al-Assad and Mohammed bin Salman have a lot in common when it comes to uh, the privilege uh, of being young and in power does not make me encouraged. It makes me much more skeptical because these people have lived in palaces, have lived with privilege, and so their lens of what is reality is very different than ours. And so I knew that this was going to be a bigger problem than any of the older generations. Uh, and for both, that, that has come true. The other thing in parallel between the two is that now there is a rapprochement 
with uh, Bashar al-Assad, and now everybody wants to bring him back into the fold of, uh, of the world and keeping him in power, regardless of the war crimes that he committed against his own people. With Mohammed bin Salman, it's the same thing, right? So in the beginning when, uh, when Jamal Khashoggi was killed and everybody was withdrawing uh, from going into Saudi Arabia, everybody now was business as usual back into uh, with Saudi Arabia. Even with Congress, I doubt any of the resolutions that have come uh, to, that are going to come to Trump's desk are going to actually translate to anything real and tangible and putting pressure on Saudi Arabia. So the Congress did, did act to... They did, Mr. yeah. Warren, but yeah. now he's yeah. going to probably veto it. Yes. So let's uh, let, let's see if uh, if he does or he doesn't. So I'm uh, sorry, I'm not very optimistic about uh, about this White House and this administration. No, no, I can understand <laughs> why you wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, in terms of the scale of the carnage in Yemen, give us a, just a, a, a brief sense of that. And also, you know, one of the powerful things about one of your films was you documented the fact that. U.S. was not just supplying guidance for weapon systems, but U.S. troops are actually on the ground in Yemen. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the audacity of the United States when it comes to talking about stopping the atrocities in Yemen when they are part and parcel of what's going on in Yemen. So even the resolution that was passed was passed for stopping the Saudi coalition war in Yemen without talking about the America's forever war on terrorism in Yemen. And so the relationship and the war that was going on in Yemen it's much older than even September 11. So uh, USS Cole happened before September 11. And so they've been bombing the, the Yemeni people for a lot longer than they want to admit. And nobody within Congress and the Senate want to discuss the American counterterrorism program in Yemen. And so the drone strikes, which Obama is the one who increased and not Trump, Trump just uh, basically increased the level of what is being done inside Yemen. So exa for example, more troops on the ground, more boots on the ground, more special ops on the ground, more, pe more civilians killed, and less accurate intelligence that are, is going around now. What, so the Americans are doing uh, that they're relying on the brilliant intelligence of the Saudis and the Emiratis, uh, the UAE who are involved or on the ground, to decide who is and who isn't a terrorist. Now, the Saudis and the Emiratis themselves can't decide on who is and who isn't a terrorist. So, Muslim Brotherhood can be terrorist. Uh, they don't know the difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And all of that is resulting in a lot more civilians killed. And nobody wants to talk about this. Manal, you're trying to um, shed a light on um, what's going on in Saudi Arabia, particularly in terms of what's going on with women. You're flying out to San Francisco tomorrow. Yes. Tell me about what you're going to do out there. and. And um, yeah, can you show the hashtag? Thank you. Um, I it's actually I drive for freedom number four um, with Human Rights Foundation. I'm launching a campaign in 2018. I was supposed to drive across the country with my son to celebrate lifting the ban, but I was not able to go. And Abudi, I'm here in America. You're listening. And I'm going to do the drive across the country here in the US. I'm gonna stop by many uh, states and cities that was part of the civil rights movement. I'm gonna talk to American citizens to really shed the light about the women activists um, who are in jail today, who have been tortured. And it's really not war on women only, it is war on human rights in Saudi Arabia. I'm gonna turn 40 on the 25th, and that's the day I will be exactly standing in DC before the Saudi embassy with a sign saying I'm turning 40 today and still my son is my guardian. So I'm gonna be protesting that day there. You might follow it on I Drive for Freedom. And thank you. I wish I brought a gift with me, but uh, I brought my keys. We say, we say the the key to change in my country for us as women activists was the key to drive our cars. Because it wasn't about driving a car, it was really about driving our own destiny. If you have a key with you in your back, can I ask you, please, to take it out? I want you to make as much noise as you can to honor 
the work of all women in Saudi Arabia who are in jail today, and all the women work for us to have our rights. Shukran. Thank you, everyone.